I think when I write a song, it is like intrinsically pop, leaning a little bit of country. Hmm. Like the things that come out of my mouth when I'm writing them, like I wish, I don't want to say that, but I sometimes have wished they were a little bit less pop. If you were alive in the late aughts and early 2010s, you were dancing to Kesha. Her hit songs like TikTok and Your Love Is My Drug were the party hits of the era. And for a while, TikTok was the best-selling digital single in history. But then, Kesha went silent. For a while, she mostly disappeared from the music industry as she struggled with an eating disorder and fought a years-long legal battle with her former producer, Dr. Luke, in which she alleged physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. Dr. Luke has denied all allegations, and the two settled out of court earlier this year. Now, she's back with a new album, Gag Order, and a new tour launching this fall. And while Kesha and I didn't specifically discuss her lawsuit, she does open up about what she's learned in her time away from the industry and how she's changed her attitudes about fame, happiness, and true artistic success. I'm Charlotte Alter, senior correspondent for Time, and this is Person of the Week. I also want to warn our listeners that this episode does contain discussion of eating disorders. So I want to start at the beginning. You grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, which is such an important place for American music. How did the music scene there influence your aspirations to be a singer? Well, I think that I just was around music so much that it was unavoidable. It was inescapable and it was normal. Mm -hmm. I've come to realize now most people don't play music at their family gatherings, but like that's just what we would do. And we would go visit our friends at the Honky Tonks and they would throw me on stage at 12 years old. There was just music everywhere. So it kind of became a natural part of my life. Like you eat dinner, you write a song, you go to school, you sing a song. Yeah. (laughs) It was just in the natural flow of being a human being was music. And my mom was a songwriter. So I would take my homework to the studio and I would hide in the drum booth and be doing my math homework surrounded by drums. And they'd be like, shut up, we can hear you on the track. (laughs) And then when they were done recording, then my mom would be like, okay, hurry up, let's record you really fast for like 10 minutes. So she was always trying to give me the experiences that are usually hard to get and expensive, I realize, in hindsight. So I was just about to ask about your mom, because your mom, PB, is a songwriter as well. And so I'm curious what you learned from her. What did she teach you about this art form and about this industry and about what makes a good song? So the art form, I think... I learned a lot from her, obviously. We still write songs, like the album I just put out. We wrote a bunch of my favorite songs off that album together. But she always told me, you have to be yourself. Like, I went through a period of trying to be really mysterious and really quiet. And (laughs) she would just look at me and be like, what are you doing? (laughs) Like, I'm being mysterious. And she's like, just, you have to just be yourself. Like, be yourself you're never going to be happy if you're not yourself. And you're also never going to be successful if you're not yourself. Hmm. So I remember just kind of being like, all right, I guess I'm going to lean into myself, which is not always what I want to do. But I have seen the times that I do, I feel more successful and not even like numbers. It's like, I feel it in my bones. I feel more honest. I feel more transparent. I feel more like the artist that I meant to be. Wow. So you ended up leaving high school at 17 to pursue music full time. So Mm -hmm. what was that decision like? And what was it like when you first moved to LA to do this? Well, so at the time I was 17 and I was like, okay, I'm either going to study psychology and comparative religion because I love knowing what makes people follow another human. Hmm. And I feel like being a rock star, it's like, you're a demigod. You have a following. I guess I was just kind of obsessed with why people follow certain people and the ultimate truths of the universe and how to make society work, like what those are. Hmm. And then I also was a scuba diver. I still am a scuba diver, but 
I was like, okay, I'm going to do one of three things. I'm going to be a total touring badass musician, or I'm going to be a scuba dive instructor, or I'm going to study comparative religion and psychology. This was my first try at one of them, and so I was successful, thank God. But I did decide to leave school at 17. I was in this program called the International Baccalaureate Program. So I Oh, was, I did that program. You did? So yeah. we're both smarties. <laughs> so, yeah, you're a, you're a super smarty. I mean— <laughs> So when people act like that's such a shocking thing, of course it makes me want to self-examine and wonder why I come off as so stupid. But, like, in the studio, it was a conscious choice— to be like, okay, I'm just going to make this really silly, dumb song. I'm going to make it dumber, even dumber. Like, it's going to be so dumb. And that was TikTok. But, like, that did so well. So what is that saying about all of society? We like dumb shit. Right. So if I just have fun and play, how does that make me dumb? But I did have a hard time with that, for sure. Yeah. So why, though? What motivated you to, as you just put it, try to dumb down your music? Um, I always remember being like, people can find out I can sing my ass off later. Wow, was that a mistake? I didn't realize that the first impression will literally last forever. Hmm. Things like brushing my teeth with whiskey. It's like, these are all funny things. It's funny. I grew up on the Beastie Boys and, like— that was like a huge inspiration, licensed ill. So I was like, okay, I can just have fun with this. Like, it's fun. But I didn't realize that if I did that, it was going to be the lasting impression of the entirety of my career. Like, people are just going to be so locked into the fact that still today at 36, do I brush my teeth with Jack Daniels? Get that question. You do? People ask you that? That's insane. All the time. That's a- <laughs> Yeah. Needless to say, I don't. Well, it did happen one time in my 20s. So A lot fairness, of things happen in people's 20s. But, That's fine. <laughs> yes. But I remember also thinking when I was younger, people can learn that I'm joking. It's not important to me on the first album to prove how much I can sing. Mm-hmm. And then I feel like I've been fighting this whole perception of the fact that I cannot sing my entire career now. During this time when these songs were such huge hits, you were sort of seen as this kind of like pop star wild child. And you had albums that were named things like Animal and Cannibal. And was that the persona that you wanted to present? And how did that relate to the real you? I think that I grew up on punk and like wild child music. So Mm -hmm. it was an honor for me to be seen as a wild child. Like I grew up on Iggy Pop and the Stooges and Bowie and... The Stones and Neil Young, like, nobody thought, they're kind of freaky. They're all a little bit of, like, lovingly in the best way possible. They're freaks. So I wanted to be in that category of thought, Mm -hmm. not the perfect pop star category of thought. So I was kind of proud of myself for that. But the, like, when it came down to the actual partying, that's something that's always bothered me. Because as much as I do sing about it, I've definitely gone out and had wild nights. But the fact that that became such a staple of who I was sucked because you can Google it. There's no pictures of me out there like doing crazy drugs or getting so wasted and falling over. Like it's just not who I was. You think of like a pop star. It's all kind of this unachievable perfection, this beauty, this body, this face. Like Hmm. everything is just so perfect. Although I definitely felt insecure kind of being the poster child of it, I just felt so not that. Hmm. I was out there being a freak. (laughs) And I think everybody has a little tiny bit of a freak inside of them. Whether or not you ever let it out, everybody has a little bit of it. So I think I tapped into people's freakiness and like non-perfection and also gave them an escape. More with Kesha about what her ups and downs in the music industry have taught her when we come back. So 
So you had this big moment, and then you were away from the industry for some time. And then you had this big comeback at the Grammys in 2018. How did some distance help you see the music industry more clearly? I think that was the period of time that my eating disorder got so bad that I had to address it or I was literally going to die. Because keep in mind, I've been sprinting Mm -hmm. up till then, like just running. Up to that point, I would be showering and like someone would yell at me questions and I'd be eating during makeup. Mm -hmm. Like there was no time. So having the time and space to think, I was like, oh, I'm not in it. I'm not so heavily in it. And I can see that it's kind of like an abusive relationship, right? And when you're in it, you think it's normal. Mm -hmm. And then when you're out of it, you're like, oh, that's super f***ed up. And I didn't even realize. So in that space, I also made an album with some of the most amazing collaborators, like Ray Ball, Drew Pearson, Stuart Mm -hmm. Crichton, my mom, um, Ryan Lewis, and Ben Abraham. We did Praying. And so that felt like such redemption because I felt like I was keeping so much kind of hidden away from the world Mm -hmm. in hopes of creating this, you know, I'm a pop star illusion. I'm good enough to be here. And then when I went and got treatment for my eating disorder, it was kind of like, okay, this is what it is. And then people still seem to like my music and accept me for like who I actually was with the literal weight off my shoulders. And that was a really beautiful thing. And I think that was the shift. People were like, oh my God, she can kind of sing. And I was like, thank God, finally. (laughs) And during that time, of course, music has changed a lot. There's a very different musical vibe now in the 2020s that's very different from the music that was made in the aughts. What do you think is different about the way music is produced and experienced? And looking back, Why do you think your music at that time was such a unique fit for that moment? And how do you think the moments changed? Um, I really think, like, the economic situation did play into why TikTok was such a big song. It was just of the time there was, Mm -hmm. like, a housing market crash. I think people wanted that escape at that time. Obviously, music has changed a lot. Ironically, now TikTok, the app is like one of the main determining factors if your song is going to be successful. Mm -hmm. It's less about an album. It's more about one song. And now it's not even about one song. Now it's about eight seconds of a song. Wow. So I've had some of the biggest commercial success an artist could ever have. And it is always so satisfying to have that. Success to me now means feeling free. Hmm. And the art is where I put my secrets. Like the last album I just made certainly did not do as well as TikTok. But I feel so free that to me, that is success now. Because hmm. it's totally impossible to always be the biggest artist of all time. At some point, somebody new or somebody old or whatever is going to come along and be the moment. And to just chase being the moment forever sounds really sad. Yeah. How did you learn that? How did you come to that realization? Girl, by pain. I think pain is the greatest teacher. And I can say I've had an incredibly painful life. Hmm. And then I also have had an incredibly blessed and lucky and very privileged life. So I think just being aware of both can be true. So your newest album is called Gag Order. And in an interview with the DJ Zane Lowe, you described working on this album with Rick Rubin as a type of, like, pop star rehab. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that? What did you mean by that? Okay. Previously to working with Rick, it was like I would have these meetings and you would go and it'd be like, here's a song. This could be the first single. Here's the hype track. And this is maybe the second single. And this is the third one. And this video producer is so hot. We're going to send this to radio and blah, blah, blah. 
And you always would write the songs to cater to the audience, hmm. to cater to what a listener is going to think. And when I went in with Rick, he really encouraged me, like, don't worry about the audience. Make the art for yourself. And it blew my mind. Hmm. And I remember sitting there and being like, because, you know, I'm in there alone now. So I'm the one advocating for myself now and, like, trying to replicate this process that I saw, quote, unquote, the adults do, where it's like, okay, here's the single and here's the hype track. And he just, like, stared at me. And then we never talked about it again. Wow. (laughs) So what does that mean? Does that mean you were sort of unlearning things that you had learned in the earlier part of your career about how music is made? Well, about how music is made, about why you make it. Hmm. I never even thought about having a super long intro to a song because it's like, no, you're going to lose the attention of the listener. And like, I had to completely be like, no, go into your guts. What do you feel in there? Hmm. And then whatever that is, make it come out of your mouth. Versus like me sitting here and being like, disco's popping off right now. Let me make a disco track. It was the opposite of the way I have been gorilla trained for over a decade to make music. He, I think, like, saved my life. Hmm. Rick Rubin, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So the songs on this album, for this reason, sound a lot different than what most people know you for, which are these, like, big, bold, brash bangers. So this is really a reinvention for you. How did you think about reinvention as an artist? Well, I mean, everyone knows Madonna's the queen of reinvention. So that was like, always I would see her and I was like, wow, it's like necessary to reinvent. But I didn't realize how it was going to feel myself. And then when the reinvention kind of happened, it's uncomfortable. Like, yeah, it's uncomfortable to not lean on what you know people like and also what has worked before. But if you have some of the biggest songs in the world and still feel empty inside, you know you got to look at something. Hmm. You know you have to readjust. Yeah. Yeah. Because I always felt like I was chasing this thing. You know, if I put out a record and it's successful, et cetera, et cetera, then I'll be happy. And then when I got there... And not only was I not happy, I felt like I was holding so many secrets and who I really am away from people. Like, I don't know, I feel just like so gross. There was one red carpet where I'm walking and I'm like so anorexic. And I don't want to be a part of the problem in culture of pushing that as being okay for young girls to look up to. Like, I want to... I have to lead by example, Mm -hmm. I feel. Yeah. I mean, I can tell this is such an emotional topic. And I really appreciate your candor on this because I think there are a lot of people, particularly women, who are asking themselves a lot of the same questions right now around the relationship between external success and real happiness. So... What do you want young girls and young women to know about fame that you wish you'd known when you were younger? I just think, like, get it. Like, if you want that, you work and you get it and I believe in you and you can have it and you deserve it. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to fix any problem you got with yourself. Like... The more likes you get on Instagram, it's like, you always want more. Mm -hmm. The more plays you have, you always want more. The more people come to your show, you always want more. Like, it's just, it's dangerous. So I would say stay grounded and keep good people around you and take time to yourself and reflect and try not to get too sucked up in it that you lose perspective because that definitely happened to me. Yeah. So you're going on tour again starting October 15th in Dallas. I am, yes. How do you feel about performing again? And how are you trying to make this phase different from earlier phases? Oh, God, this phase is so different. I'm really excited about this tour. I'm redoing lots of things, and it's all really cool, and I'm playing songs I haven't played in forever, and I'm 
creating a new relationship with some of the songs maybe aren't my favorite from my catalog. I'm like playing them in a really fun way. I think the fans are going to like that. And I have a kind of newfound lust for life Hmm. in the midst of rehearsals. I'm really excited because I feel like for as tumultuous as my career has been, my fans have been there along the way. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing I really, if I'm good with myself and I'm good with them, they're good. Yeah. You lost the dollar sign in your name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, why? Um, Because it felt like that was like, I have two sides, right? I have like this bratty side. And then I have like the me who's showing up to talk to you today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> who I think is like actually who I am. But I think for a long time people thought I was kind of that like Jack Daniels, crazy wild party girl. And like... You look at the paparazzi pictures. I'm always playing at the beach with my girlfriends. Like, it's so innocent. Yeah. (laughs) But I wanted people to just, in trying to bear more of my voice, literally, with praying and stuff, and speak more about my emotions, and really excavate all the stuff from inside, and try to be a more genuine, authentic, transparent person, I just thought, all right, I feel a little bit more naked, but I'm just going to use my real name. Well, Kesha, thank you so much for joining us. It's been so eye-opening to hear about your music trajectory, your career, your influence on the music industry, and also the distance between the real you and the projection of you. And I think you've been so insightful and generous. But now, before we go, uh, we want to hear some more about the everyday things that shape you. So I'm going to ask you some lighthearted, rapid-fire questions where you just say the first thing that comes to your mind. We call this segment The Last Time. Let's go. Okay. Great. When's the last time you blasted a song full volume in your car? Mm, Yesterday morning. What was it? It was some guy sent me a song that he said reminded him of me, and it sucked, so then I was (laughs) mad about it. (laughs) (laughs) We've all been there. Um, (laughs) When's the last time you learned a new dance move? Oh, God. Uh, Last night. For tour? Yes. Yeah. When's the last time you got a tarot reading? Oh, recently. Uh, I think last week. And can you tell us what it said? Um, Basically, I'm forgetting the whole gist, but I'm a goddess, and I should live in my goddess energy. And I was like, duh, of course. I know that. Yeah. (laughs) When's the last time you read a book you loved? Um, I'm reading a book by Alejandra Jodorowsky right now that's really good. And I'm forgetting the title. And then I'm also reading Attached about attachment styles. Very interesting. Interesting. When's the last time you had a night in? Um, well, if I got back from tour rehearsal at like 1130, does that count? Yeah. Okay. Then last night. <laughs> I came home and crashed 13 hours of dancing. Wonderful. Kesha, thank you so much for being here with us today. I really appreciate your insight and your candor. Thank you. Bye. You can catch Kesha on tour in a city near you starting October 15th. Thank you so much for listening to Person of the Week. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd love to hear from you. So send your tips or thoughts on our show to personoftheweek at time.com. I'm Charlotte Alter. See you next week. Person of the Week is hosted by Charlotte Alter. It's produced by Nina Bisbano and India Witkin. Our senior producer is Ursula Summer. Our story editor is Katie Feather. This episode was mixed by Aaron Dalton. Our theme music was composed by Billy Libby. Joseph Frischmith is our fact checker. Person of the Week is a co-production of Time Studios and Trigger 23. At Time, our executive producers are Mike Beck and Sam Jacobs. At Trigger 23, our executive producers are Mike Mayer, Michael Sugar, and Liam Billingham. Sasha Mathias is the head of audio at Time. You can find us online at time.com slash person of the week and wherever you get your podcasts.